Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspect of running, and this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. This episode is sponsored by Johnji. Johnji is a local to Boston running apparel company dedicated to exploring, connecting, and giving back through running. Inspired by travel, informed by function, and built for adventure, Johnji makes running essentials to equip you wherever you run or roam. The company was founded on the core belief that water is a human right and donates 2% of their sales to supporting clean water organizations around the world. I've known the two co-founders of Johnji for over five years, and it's been a privilege to see them grow and increase the level at which they've been able to give back to the running community and to the world in general. Welcome back. Today, I have Mike Bernstein joining me on the podcast. Mike, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, so first question is generally a, a tough one. Uh, who, is, who is Mike? <laughs> who is Mike? Oh, that is a tough one. I don't really know how to sum that up, but I'm, uh, I'm a guy. I'm living in, uh, in Cambridge, grew up in greater Boston. I'm one of the co-founders of John G., a running apparel brand. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. That's about that. Awesome. Well, we'll get into John G, who will be the um, the sponsor of, of the next uh, handful of podcasts here. But first, I want to talk about you uh, and your own running. Uh, you've been a runner for, for quite a while. Um, do you remember your first run? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I think I do. I, uh, I joined the cross country team freshman year in high school because I wanted to get in shape to try to make the basketball team. That was my real goal. And I thought it would, it would help. And, um, I remember suffering through my first run. It was a lap of the Brookline reservoir. And um, <laughs> I went to Brookline high. So yeah, I, I, it was not fun, but I, I, it eventually it hooked me. It just took a little while. And at what point did it start becoming fun? Um, I think I, I, I had some natural ability in running. And so I think it became fun for me initially from the competitive side where I started out and I was new to it. And then I started doing pretty well and beating guys on my team and competing against other teams. And I, I really I'm, I can be very competitive and I really like the competitive side of the sport. And so that really hooked me. And it wasn't until I think later that um, I mellowed out into more of a casual runner than I am today. But it, initially, I think I really liked competing. And you ran in college as well, right? I did. Yeah, I, um, I ran for one year at Trinity College in Connecticut and then, it, I, and then transferred and ran at WashU and St. Louis, which are, they're both D3 schools. And what was the, what was the collegiate experience like for you? You mentioned you've, you've had some, uh, some funny stories from that. Yeah. I, um, it was great. Honestly, um, I've been really lucky to be part of some really amazing teams. Um, I think that's, that's another element that really drew me into the sport was I, I loved cross country and I was never crazy about track because I just loved being with a team, bonding with a team, training with them, making great friends. And for the Brooklyn high Trinity, even though I didn't stick around and in Wash U, I had some pretty special teams that I was a part of. So it was really cool. Um, at, uh, Wash U, we had like a really big program. There was like 50 guys and, um, and we got really tight. Um, the program kind of got a lot better throughout my time there, which is always fun to be on something kind of on the upswing. And, uh, and yeah, it was also around the same time that I started John G with one of my teammates, Dave. Um, and so that was, that was a really special experience as well to kind of take the college team experience and then kind of continue on with it post-grad with, with my career. Did you, you, uh, you guys founded John G when you were in college? Yeah. Um, we, we had the initial idea. Um, we had both qualified for D3 nationals in the 10 K. 
um, my sophomore year and his junior year. And um, it was the bus ride home from that race where we got to talking kind of, you know, runners high feeling nostalgic, um, just feeling really connected to the sport. Um, and Dave had been separately, he had taken a, another a business class and had sort of done a project on like starting, uh, running apparel company and trying to, it was something totally separate. It was like trying to make cheaper clothing, um, to compete with Nike and just try to make like split shorts that were cheaper than what Nike charged. And I think the conclusion of the business plan for that class was that it was a a bad idea and couldn't work, (laughs) but it, but it got everything, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, we had just run the 10 K at, at D three nationals, which was in Ohio. And, um, it was a crazy hot, record day in Ohio and um they were like hosing people off on the track as we ran the 25 laps um and we we both finished and we were just super happy like the race had gone well we were kind of in that spot where we neither of us had qualified before we were really happy to be there um and post race i think we just were talking about the future and what we wanted to do and i think um we were inspired by like that race and the the impact water had on us getting through it. And we thought it would be pretty cool to try to start a company in the running space and, um, you know, really keep that like team vibe in the sport that we loved going post-grad because we couldn't really imagine it ending. And what was your, what was your major? So yeah, we were ill prepared to start a business. Um, Dave was a history major, and I was an urban studies major. So <laughs> kind of a mix like of history and uh, econ and sociology and poli sci. So not nothing too practical. Do you remember the the moment when you guys said, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna do it. Let's let's go for it." Um, so like the, was there was it a culmination of something, or was there a, a an acute event? I know you mentioned the water on the track, but what was the, what pushed you over the edge? Yeah. Uh, well, there was that initial bus ride where the idea happened of like, we should start a, a running right. apparel brand, but kind of do it our way and try to make a difference. Um, and we, from there, I think we started tinkering and working on it and recruited a couple of our other teammates um, who kind of brought things to the table that we didn't know how to do. Like there were literally, um, there was another guy who was an architecture major who helped design initial shorts and another guy who is kind of a business operations guy that helped with the supply chain. And we all started working on it and we, we, we took it pretty seriously from the start. Um, but I think it became real a couple, like a year or so later we entered into a um, a couple different business competitions where you present your business plan for the chance to win funding. Um, and we, there was one in particular that we, we flew um, like the week before our conference meet, we flew to Colorado Springs to present in the final round of this sports industry business competition that was hosted by the Olympic commission. And, um, we presented like all day for a couple of days and there's a bunch of other teams there. And we, we ended up winning the the prize, um, which was pretty, pretty wild and out of this world. Like literally this guy who's an Olympic gold medalist in Greco Roman wrestling named Rulon Gardner. He was also on the, the show, the biggest loser. He was sort of hosting the, the competition. Um, he's this massive guy. And, he, and they announced that we had won and they handed us this giant check that you get, you know, from like winning a golf tournament <laughs> or something. And we won like 20 grand, um, which at the time was like, and you know, and still is a, a huge sum of money. Um, and that I think is when it got really real because we had made so many promises to the judges that we were going to do this. And at this point we were still in school. Um, and with us kind of taking that check, we, we knew we really had to move forward with it. You know, it'd be one thing if there was like an idea, but no money to make it happen. We could sort of just graduate and then maybe 
move on and try to find a real job. But with with this twenty thousand dollar check in the bank, it was like, oh, we got we got to follow through. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, what we did was we. Um, it's actually funny talking to you about this because I recently ran into you at the running event trade show in Austin. Yeah. Um, and we, we had some kind of friends and mentors that owned this running store in St. Louis called big river running. Um, and one of the store owners, Ben Rosario is actually yeah. the, the Northern Arizona coach. And he's still a huge figure in the sport, which is cool. But he started out by owning this running store and he was one of our friends um, Dave worked there part time, and he was like, "Well, you gotta it's like if you want to make this business happen, you gotta go to to this trade show." And so we looked into it, and it was like five thousand dollars for a booth, which was like a quarter of our money. Um, and we're like, "Okay, we got to do this." And one of the things I love about my business partner is he's just like such a charger. Like I'm, I feel like I'm more of like a sit back and think about it, and he just like always likes to move forward. Um, so he signed us up for this trade show that was happening, you know, in a, in a few months and we got a booth and we figured from that point, we, we needed to get ready for that trade show. So that took like, we need to get a booth together. We needed samples. We needed, um, like a catalog. Um, and then at that store, we were going to then meet with, or at that trade show is where we would meet with all these different running stores and hopefully get them to carry John G. That was kind of our strategy in the beginning. Um, and the process of getting us ready for that trade show was just pretty hilarious for like these college students that had no product and no experience. Um, but we had, we had some like cool mock-ups and our designer, David Ham had, um, he had created the design, um, although he was he created it using like architectural software, so it wasn't even really meant for, um, you know, he wasn't using like an apparel based design software. It's just like what we had, and um, I think what we did was we 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 couldn't get the real fabric um, in time that we wanted to make the shorts with, but we bought similar fabric from I think Joanne Fabric, and then we bought die from walmart and i remember david ham's hands being just bright blue because he had dyed the fabric in his bathtub um and his hands were blue for like a week um and then we we took that dyed fabric and we mailed it to a a a sample maker that we had heard about in the garment district of new york who specializes in making samples and we worked with them and we printed catalogs and, and designed them and we needed to make a booth. So we recruited our friend, Nick, who was a carpenter um, and an engineering student. And he, he built this booth for us and um, God bless him. He, he worked so hard um, trying to get the booth ready in time that like the two of us were up all night finishing it and spray painting all the panels and assembling it. Um, that he, and he was so laser focused on that, that he literally missed his engineering final and had to take (laughs) an incomplete for that class for the quarter, um, or for the semester, because we were scrambling to get this booth together. And I remember, you know, we threw the booth in the back of my car and I basically just drove 12 hours straight to Austin to get to the trade show on time and like picked up the catalogs on the way and the the sample maker, I still remember his name is George Ting mailed the samples made from the Joanne fabric, um, directly to our motel in Austin. And we scrambled and kind of set the booth up and the the panels that we had spray painted all sort of just sealed together because the paint wasn't dry in the back of my car. So we had to sort of (laughs) peel them apart and they got kind of messed up, but we, we got that booth together. And I think, I think we signed up something like 30 stores to like order Johnji for the following season at that show. Um, and that, that definitely sealed it as far as something like we had to follow through on. And, and I think it gave us just faith. Like if we could make this happen, then we could actually make the company happen. Um, and I, I remember basically writing like the last 20 pages of my urban studies thesis on the, 
the 12 hour car ride home because that was due like the same week. And I was just scrambling to finish it. But my mind was so sad. I'm like, I'm not even interested in urban studies anymore. I really wanted to just focus on this business. Um, and that was like a huge shift for us. That's so cool. Um, one of the things that I uh, like to focus on on the podcast is um, is a phrase that my coach uses all the time: "Shoot your shot." You know, take a risk. Um, there's no better uh, example of shooting your shot than showing up to a place that's twelve hours away with no experience and just a passion for the outcome without knowing how to get there. Um, so I love, I love that story and sort of the resiliency that, that you guys displayed or the blind courage, you could also call it, um, that, you know, this was the, this was the right move. Did you ever doubt that? I mean, 30, 30 buyers is a lot. Like, did you ever doubt that you would have a successful outcome? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, what was there that was like? Certainly, certainly doubt all throughout. Um, I think, you know, it's definitely a fake it till you make it kind of scenario where you just, you need to have faith that you're going to figure it out, even though you don't have the answers right there. So it's just yeah. accepting the orders and them saying, okay, so this will be ready, you know, October 1, right? And you're like, uh, yeah, sure. We can do that, even though in your head you're like, well, we don't have a factory. We haven't seen a final prototype. We don't even really know how to do this. Um, we, have, we have no idea all of the steps that need to happen for this to this order to appear and become real. But sure, yeah, October 1, we can do that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, do you want to back up a little bit and explain for for the listeners the process of like how how does a a piece of running apparel make its way into a running specialty store? Sure. Um, so let's see, where do I start in, in terms of the, um, you know, the kind of ordering process, a running store would have a buyer that would check out the lines from different companies and then place orders. Um, so like, for example, right now, stores are sort of finishing up their orders for the spring 21 season. So kind of like six months before the season stores place their orders with what apparel they want to bring in. And that's, that's what we were showing. We were showing our, our apparel for like the following season. Now, then um, there's sort of the separate process of, of brands working with factories to kind of develop their lines, you know, and take the initial, designs and and work with the factory to develop them and source the materials and create the finished product and then it shows up in the store people see it and they love it and they buy it yep (laughs) that's right (laughs) um that's super cool it's uh the the sort of the behind the scenes angle is is always fascinating to me when i learned that you know you're buying and and selling six months ahead of um, ahead of whatever season that is. Um, that was surprising the first time I heard it. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about John G itself. The mission is super cool. Uh, as mentioned at the, at the top here, um, you guys are, are coming on as a sponsor for the next couple of months. And as we've talked about, I've, I only, you know, work with brands and people at those brands that I like and trust and, uh, have used in the past, and I've known you guys for I don't know five, six years now. So, talk to me about about the the mission at John G and why it's different than um, some of the other running apparel brands out there. Yeah. Um, so, core to John G is this idea that that water is a human right, and people everywhere deserve access to clean water and sanitation. Um, I think as As runners, we all know the importance of hydration and having access to water to be able to do what we love. And um, we believe that holds true for for everyone around the world. Um, And uh, starting Janji, we were really inspired by how philanthropic runners are and how rare that is and special. Like the London Marathon is the biggest charitable event in the world. 
I'm pretty sure. Um, and you know, every year people are inspired to to raise money to run, you know, the Boston Marathon or the New York Marathon, and it inspires them to to get up every morning and train. Um, and we we wanted to find a way to kind of channel that really unique enthusiasm that exists amongst runners, um, and and focus it towards what we believe is a really important cause, which is clean water. And um, when co- communities don't have access to clean water, there's just all these really negative ramifications that trickle down throughout society. But when it's something that is put into place, the the positives that come from it are, are huge from, you know, economic output and education and um, health, you know, really everything kind of becomes possible once the water component is in place. Um, and we also, um, even though Dave and I have the background of being competitive runners in, in college, you know, I think we have always been the type to use running as a way to see new places and connect with new people. So many of our close friends we met through running and whenever we go to a new place, we love to just kind of, you know, tie up our running shoes and just go check it out on foot. Um, and we wanted to bring some of that exploratory element into the brand as well. So every season we actually focus on a different region around the world and um, we connect with people in that in that place. Um, we we work with artists from that region to help design a super unique collection, and then two percent of our revenue from the collection supports um, clean water efforts in in that part of the world. So uh, right now we're wrapping up our Philippines collection, and uh, we're partnering with an NGO in Manila called the Manila Water Foundation that's working to address clean water issues, um, in the Philippines. That's awesome. One of the, um, at one of the pop-up shops you guys had, I think around the Boston marathon, you had something on one of your walls that summarizes, um, pretty much exactly what you were just saying. And, and correct me if I get this wrong, but it was something like inspired by the places we go and the people we meet. Is that, is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Good memory. Um, (laughs) absolutely. I think, you know, uh, we, we visit and run in, you know, every, every place that inspires our collections and we do two different collections every season. So before the Philippines collection was, um, let's see, we did the, um, Cambodia collection and the Mexico collection. And it's always a really amazing experience to, to visit a new place, connect with the local running community, work with artists to design the collection. And then, you know, try to use the sport to give back and support clean water efforts. Um, the only um, change that we have with the season ahead is um, we're entering the new collection, which is the South Africa collection, which we're super excited about. And um, we were able to design the collection with some amazing artists based in Cape Town um, named Mr. and Mrs. Luke. It's kind of a husband and wife duo. And we're unable to be there right now, which we normally would be to kind of visit and run and explore and and kind of test out the new collection and photograph it. Um, But the cool thing about 21st century is, you know, we were able to connect with, with runners and photographers who live there remotely, you know, through Instagram and through email and um, kind of make friends with people. And we're actually like, we shipped out all of our gear, um, in three huge boxes a few weeks ago. And, you know, right now there's trail runners running around Cape town wearing John Deere gear and shooting it. And we'll be releasing those kind of photos along with the collection shortly. Um, actually it just hit the website um, today, which is funny timing, but uh, it's just something that's really cool about the sport. I think is that you're able to build these relationships with people all over the world. You know, usually when you're there in person you can kind of run together, but even, even without that, and during this time of COVID, you know, you can still connect with people online, which is really cool. Definitely. What have been some of the cha- the other challenges of being in the running apparel industry in 2020? Yeah. Um, it's and, a strange what time. Have, what have you done to, to overcome? I think overall, you know, we're feeling really fortunate that, um, as a brand, we, you know, we focus on running 
because there's so many things that people can't do right now. Um, uh, and running is just something that is still a great outlet for people. I think people are running now more than ever. It's just a great way to really stress, you know, even if you can't go to spin or your rock climbing gym or whatever you might normally do, running is still there. And so actually more people are running now than ever. Um, but there's definitely, there's tons of challenges for sure. Um, a huge focal point for our brand is, is travel and, you know, travel is just a lot harder. So we're trying to really focus more on like local travel, um, local adventure. Like there's, there's so much to see and experience within a couple hours drive of, of home that you don't need to fly. You know, you don't need to go somewhere totally new. You can even stay in your, your city and your neighborhood and you can still kind of run and explore and see new places. Um, so that's good. Um, from a business perspective, I think there's definitely challenges with like on the manufacturing side. Um, we make our clothing mostly in Vietnam, which has been largely untouched um, by um, COVID. But there's definitely, you know, elements of the supply chain where like fabrics have gotten held up or trims, or there's just generally been like a lot of delays on that side. And there's just also a lot of uncertainty um, with, you know, what's going to be happening with um, with running and with consumers and with stores. Um, so at first we kind of braced ourselves for like total, um, like a total shutdown of, of everything we do. And we kind of paused a lot of our production um, bracing for the worst. And then we found that people are, you know, they're still shopping online, they're still running. Um, and we were able to kind of unpause that and continue to make our gear, which is, which has been good. Um, but yeah, I think there's also a lot of challenges on the, the store side where John G sells stuff on our website, but we also sell in stores. Like we're in around a hundred running stores around the country, as well as the outdoor chain REI. And um, a lot of stores have had to close and then some have reopened and then closed again. And um, that's just something that's just an ongoing struggle for sure. I think shopping is, is not really the same as what it used to be. Definitely. And one of the biggest um, drivers of, I guess, community for you guys initially, and I, I love being a part of it, was the grassroots focus and like being on the ground. Um, so I, I remember you guys had the pop-up on Newberry for a while, uh, or I guess it was, wasn't a pop-up, it was a store. Um, was that 2017? And like it, it was, it felt like more than just a running, a piece of running apparel. You know, you had the speaker events, you had all this, you had all that. Um, where did where did the idea for that kind of stuff come from, or was that just the like the core of of Janji, where it was it was all about the community? Yeah, um, well, we just you know we believe in the power of running to build community, and we love this idea of using running as a way to explore and see new places. And we wanted you know we there's so much running culture in Boston. There's a million clubs, but we wanted to do things a little bit differently. And so we started our, our run club that um, every week we would visit different, different murals and art installations around the city on our runs. And it was, it was really fun um, at the time. And um, since then, we, we don't have a, it was a pop-up and we no longer have any pop-ups. We're more kind of focused on, on like our supporting our stores and our, our website. Um, but we have, you know, really grown the community through our John G collective program, which is now kind of a community of 3000 runners, um, all over the world. So the hope is that, you know, whenever you are in kind of a new city or a new place, you, you have this network of runners that you can connect with who embody that same philosophy kind of anywhere. Um, and we hope to, continue our our in-person experiences once that becomes doable and you know we've had a lot of fun hosting international running trips um in mexico and bolivia and patagonia um because we still believe running is an amazing way to see new places but for now that's on pause until it becomes a little bit safer definitely 
How have some of the um, lessons you've learned from John G translated into life or your own running when it comes to taking risks or trying new things? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think, I think you know, with John G, I've definitely learned that you can, you know, you can figure something out if you just give it enough time and effort. You're not going to get it at first, and we had we've had so many struggles with John G, um, so many ups and downs. You know, so many such a learning curve um, in starting this business out of school um, that I've learned to apply that for sure um, with daily life and just kind of understanding that nothing comes immediately and that there's a process and this sort of faith, but it's not just like a baseless faith. It's like a faith that's paired with continual testing and effort. Um, And I think that's just a philosophy that will kind of serve you anywhere. Definitely. Um, a question that I I like to ask professional athletes is to fast forward 10 years, what are you proud of? Um, so I'm going to ask you the same question. Fast forward 10, 15 years, what have you, what have you done that, that you're really proud of? Um, I think, um, you know, huge, um, you know, factor in starting John G is, is really to, to make a difference when it comes to the issue of, of clean water with almost a billion people around the world lacking access to clean water. Um, you know, that was the inspiration for starting it. And sometimes in the day to day, you don't, you're not thinking about that that much. You're more focused on marketing and, um, like a launch that's coming up or product development problems. Um, but yeah, I think when we take a step back at this point, um, I think, the business has now contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars towards our clean water partners. Um, and to me, like those organizations are the ones doing incredible work. Um, whether it's, um, you know, Manila water foundation or water aid in South Africa, supporting them in the work that, that they do is, is really spectacular and just being a part of the impact that they're able to have. Um, we just so much believe in that mission and, to be able to further that mission by working with the organizations that are best at it um, is, is really special. That's awesome. Um, 2020 has taught a lot of people that their time is super valuable and it's hard to, um, you know, it's an asset that no matter how wealthy you are, how healthy you are or anything, you can't get more time. And so people are realizing that they, you know, we spend a lot of time working and a lot of time sleeping and that's, you know, then, then there's some, some time outside of that. That has led to a lot of people thinking about like, why don't I like my job more? I've had this conversation with a lot of friends and a lot of, I've seen it a lot on social media lately that people are, you know, complaining about, um, the lack of of fulfillment in what they do. It seems like you have that. I feel like I have that, and I'm I'm uh, I feel that that's a huge privilege that we're able to to have and share. So for those that might not be in that position but are interested in maybe pursuing their own passion project, um, what what advice would you give them as someone who who did exactly that and you know took a major risk? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, we were fortunate when we started John G that we we just didn't know what we didn't know. And we were green and out of school. And um, the opportunity cost was relatively low because we didn't have families or kids or any, um, you know, other kind of pending job offers that we were turning down. If I were starting, if I were to do it all over again, I certainly probably wouldn't do it that way. I think it's really important to get experience and kind of understand the space that you're thinking about starting a business in. Um, And I think, you know, it's definitely something you have to weigh between like diving in and like kind of 
learning and analyzing. And there's different types of people that always skew one way or the other, you know, the people that are super apt to like jump in way too soon and maybe quit their job and give up everything when it's maybe not the right call. And then the flip side is people that, you know, they, um, they're going to kind of just analyze and have pages and pages of notes, but they're going to work at their job that they hate forever because they're never going to take that plunge. Um, and I think understanding which one of those two people you are can kind of help dictate when you're ready. You know, if you're someone that's just much more cautious, you should encourage yourself to take the plunge because if, if you don't, it'll just never happen. And then on the flip side, you know, it, it all starts from knowing yourself. Um, so once you know yourself, I think you can kind of take a more rational approach to what you're thinking about doing. Um, and there's tons of ways to kind of start working on something on the side. Like I think in this day and age, especially with remote work, um, people have more flexibility, which is really cool. And now is kind of the, the best time to get entrepreneurial and um, start, you know, your side hustle, kind of like what you, you're doing right now with the podcast. Yeah, it's a good good time for podcasting. People have a lot of a lot of time to listen to podcasts. Um, well, that's awesome. I think that I th- I like the sort of you need to know who you are and and let that play in your favor. Um, I think there are a lot of people that are risk averse and then not very risk averse, and it's you know figuring out which side of that equation, which side of that line you're on, and then what's a, a calculated enough next step thanks again to john g for sponsoring this episode as a runner you know the importance of hydration but you might not know that almost 800 million people lack access to drinking water by working together we can create viable solutions and collectively we can have a greater impact the john g collective is one way to do that it's a membership that earns you a ton of perks like discounts on gear and first access to new collections it's also a community of adventurous runners around the world 100% of the membership fee goes towards supporting clean water programs. I'm a member and enjoy knowing that it is a small step that each of us can take that when pooled together can have quite an impact. It's also great knowing that once the world reopens, I'll have runners in almost every city to enjoy a run with when I'm on the road in a new place. If you use the code FTLR, like for the long run, you can join the John G Collective for $50. You'll receive a free singlet as well as a special members only discount for life. Every dollar from that will go towards supporting clean water programs. I hope you'll join me. So jumping, switching gears a little bit, uh, let's talk about balance. Um, You still have, you know, running goals, you run, you travel, you have a life outside of work. How do you, how do you manage balance or do you manage balance uh, as, as the co-founder? Yeah. That's a good question. I think balance is something that is harder with with working remote when my desk is in my bedroom and I um you know sleeping ten feet away from my workstation. Um but um you know for me I operate best with balance. Like I think I um I kinda need like to have my fitness side my friendships, my family, my work, um, all there to operate on my, my peak. Um, and you know, I think I just try to, you know, kind of one of the pros of, of working for a small company and being a co-founder is you, you have some flexibility in your schedule. So I try to make sure like I am getting my bike ride in or, a run in seeing the people I care about. Um, you know, I think if you're someone that has to, you know, respond to every single email and, um, you know, be kind of perfect in that regard, you're, you're just going to be working 120 hours a week. Um, and you'll have no time for anything else, but those, those other pieces I think are the, the ones that inspire you and, you know, make you more creative. Um, and that, that's, that's the kind of stuff that's going to truly make you better at your job. It's not um, necessarily like getting to zero inbox. That's, you know, the most important. Yeah. I, I feel that deeply. Um, I think the, 
I've swung the other way uh, way too far in the past, you know, going and trying to do 110%. And you can do that. And, you know, there are times when that's necessary, but you can't, I mean, just like running, you cannot sustain high volume training forever. You cannot sustain high volume work forever. Um, and I've, I've felt that burnout when you don't have that balance. I, I've worked in a startup space before where, you know, you, you count every single penny and you make decisions on, are we paying the, um, are we paying the electricity bill or the postage bill this week? And it's only, um, it's intuitive to think that, okay, if I work till midnight every night and wake up at 7 a.m. and do it all over again the next day, it will lead to success. And I rode that for a, a while and then burnt out. And I've come to a place, and it sounds like you're, you've you come to this place as well, where like you put, you put up guardrails and the guardrails are essential to mental health, physical health, and relationships and balance and all of this. And like, if I'm running 50, 60 miles a week and, and running is going well, and my relationships with family and friends are going well, my work is better and I'm able to sleep. And that leads to more productivity in meetings and stuff like that. And I think like we've, we've gotten into the, the culture of like busy is best and it's toxic sometimes um, so it's, it's good to hear that from, uh, from you as well. For sure. Yeah. I think it's, there's so much constant communication nowadays on email and Slack and whatnot that you can, yeah, you can work 120 hours and not be done. Um, the hard thing I think is to kind of realize what are the really important things that you're doing that actually move the needle, um, for your job or for your business. Um, and so, yeah, not, not everything is going to get done, but what are the most important things? Where can I spend my time? And yeah, how can I build my, my life so that I can accomplish those things while also taking care of the other things that I need personally or that I need for my relationships? Definitely. Um, what is a, a time that you experienced what some might consider failure, but um, looking back on it, it wasn't really a failure. Um, hmm. I've, um, so in my own running, I was, um, you know, ran in college and then took running pretty seriously for a few years afterwards and ran two so uh, like below 230 in the marathon at Boston and was like really excited to continue that journey and maybe eventually try to make the Olympic trials. Um, and that was a huge part of my life and started, um, I was really fortunate to always be really healthy in my running throughout high school and college that kind of caught up with me. Um, and I've struggled with kind of these, hamstring injuries for the last um, four or so years um, where I haven't really been able to, to train um, that much. And, you know, that is a bummer and saddens me and makes me feel like I didn't accomplish my goals. Um, but the kind of positive side of it is when you're training really seriously in road running, you're just so laser focused on that goal in the, the sport you know, can sometimes stop being as much fun, especially if you're running into injury problems. Um, right. And I think my perspective has changed where it, it really is my outlet now. It's just something I, I love and my form of movement has evolved where I'm, you know, not only running on the road, I occasionally run on the road, but I like trail is easier in the body. So I get out on trails. I love hiking. I've gotten really into bike packing and gravel biking. Um, and I've just discovered all these other amazing ways of moving that have, have become a huge part of my life and are things that I just love doing that don't have any time related pressure to them. I'm not trying to hit 
any sort of PR or goal. It's just a win in and of itself to get outside and have fun. And, um, you know, in a way it's been a blessing. I think that if that, if I hadn't been injured, I would probably still just be, you know, out running repeat 400s and hitting tempos and all that. And that stuff is really, is really fun and, and cool. But, um, at the same time, it's also like, it puts running in this category of work in a way where it's a stressor and it's something that you're not, um, you know, you might run a race and not hit your time and, and be disappointed. And it, at this point in my life, you know, just being active and getting outside and exploring and seeing new places is, uh, it's a win no matter what. Um, so I'm, I'm appreciative of the, this sort of new perspective, um, despite injury challenges. That's awesome. I think that's a good place to, uh, to wrap for today. Um, so where can we first, where can we find you if we would like to follow along with your adventures? Um, I am, uh, just the John G account of Instagram. So at run John G, um, no, not, um, on Instagram myself these days. All right. Well, there we go. Or, um, um, email, um, email is good, I guess. Mike at John G.com. Cool. Mike, thanks so much for, uh, for taking some time to chat and hope we can uh, share a run or a gravel ride at some point uh, Absolutely. In, the, in the near future here. I like that. Thanks, John. Of course. All right. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next week on For the Long Run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too.